That song, Imagine, um, that, that was just sung, is a perfect lead in to this text. The text we're going to read is maybe the most important text to the Jewish faith. The Exodus book is the most important book to the Jewish faith. This text has almost a, it has four points in it which are in the Bible. It's got the recognition of people in misery. It's got the, the God having a relationship with people. It's got the, the Holy One of, of Israel. It's got calling a person as an individual. All of it's in this text. And all of that's through the Bible over and over and over again. And I remember Dr. Kathy Sackenfeld, in her class back in the early 80s, she was reading this text, and it was like we were on holy ground. It, it still has that impression to me, thinking about how important this text is to her. So I want you to think about this text in terms of imagine, and also think of it as we prepare our hearts for communion about what this text is saying to us. So listen to God's word to you as we share from book of Exodus, chapter 3, the first 15 verses. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place that you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land. A land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we open this scripture, this passage, and we pray that your insight will fill us in a way that we will see the power of your name, the power of your presence, 
and how we might recognize you in any facet that you are seeking us and that we might seek you in, in return. For your name's sake, we pray. Amen. So as I was saying, this text is supposed to be that portion of Scripture which probably lifts up who God is in our lives more than any other. The name of God. When I think of that, I think of a sermon that was given by a man named Charles Spurgeon. You may not know that name. Well-known name in any minister's library. Probably the single greatest preacher in the 19th century. Charles Spurgeon started a sermon with this brief introduction. He was preaching on January 7th, 1855. And amazingly, he's 20 years old when he says this. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom that person calls Father. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in the contemplation of the divinity. Its subject is so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Nothing will enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation into the great subject of the deity. This was the very beginning of a sermon, which back then it was very common for sermons to last well over an hour. But have no fear. We're not going to do that. This is a meditation for our communion preparation. But it's enough for us to start contemplating on the grandeur, to imagine what it will be like, how great God is. When I was a young person, I did not always want to be a minister. And uh, I was telling the other service that when I was really young, like in uh, youth and, and uh, even up through high school, I wanted to be a doctor. Do any of you all remember those models of people that you could make called the invisible man, the invisible woman, you could get an eye and turn I had them all. I painted them meticulously. I had them all over my room. I wanted to do the whole pre-med thing and took physiology courses, all of that. Um, and then I realized at some point that I thought, no, I won't be a doctor. I know, I'll be a lawyer. And I started, you remember the Boy Scouts used to have after Boy Scouts what they called a, uh, a post? I, I entered a lawyer post. Any lawyers out here? I just want to say how bad a joke I can give. Okay, so, so I, I shadowed this one lawyer for about three or four weeks in the summer. I thought, this is the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. I don't want to be a lawyer, you know. And so then I thought, I'll do, do something else. But it was, it was sometime after college. Now, I've been all the way through college when I felt the call to be a minister in the pulpit. One of the people in the narthex said, but Roger, you never told us what made you change from doctor, lawyer, to minister. I said it was the low, it was the low hours and high pay. That's what got me to be a minister. And um, so as a budding theologian, I was really interested in all those deep questions of, of people who are supposed to be ministers, right? Like, does God exist? And you have all these books on your shelves, and you're supposed to be able to answer all these questions. And I really enjoyed, in particular, at Princeton, right off of Mercer Street, there's a little door that goes downstairs, and it's called the cellar. And it was kind of a pub. And on Thursday nights, there would always be at least two Princeton professors down there and about two dozen of us budding theologians. And we would grapple with all those deep theological topics of the existence of God and other things over a beer or two. And, and um, 
I was talking to one of our very well-known theologians in, who happens to be blessing us with his presence, our own Dick Peacock, who said that he wants to start a new Sunday school class called Pub Theology. And he wants to start that right over there at Roseville Tavern. And I said, you know, Dick, why don't we do that this summer? And he goes, yes, let's get it in the heartbeat. So pay attention because uh, Dick and I are going to start a pub. Aren't we going to, Dick, D aren't you going to do that for See, there you go. So pub, pub theology is what you're going to sign up for for your next uh, Sunday school class, uh, not Sunday, Thursday night class or whatever. But now as a minister of, of, of well over 30 years experience, I have a different question that I think is more important, not more important, does God exist? All those deep theological questions are good. But here's another question that I think is a better question for us. Have you recognized God? You see, if you want to discuss the existence of God, I'm good for an hour. Let's go for it. Right afterwards, we'll get really deep and dirty and get into the scriptures. That's a great subject to get into. In fact, the Wednesday men's group went to Princeton on Wednesday. We took the bus trip did kind of an octogenarian road trip thing, only about four stops on the way there for rest stops. And um, we had a great time, had lunch with the president, Craig Barnes, who some of you remember from two years ago, our Carson lecture. And we really did talk deep subjects of faith. We just read his book called Sacred Thirst. He answered any question we had. It was just a, a, a great time by all, all of us. And it was fun to be back and to show them uh, Princeton a little bit. But, but with a brief time that we have this morning, I want us, instead of get so deep into some of those things, just look at how did Moses look to God? Because that's what I want us to consider. You see, there's so much in this text. There's more ink that has been spilt on this text than any singular passage in the Bible. Right here. Exodus 3, the name of God, I am who I am. And what the heck does that mean? But that's not what I want to share with you today. I was really intrigued in the first part of this text. Remember what's happening. Moses is at a day of work, just a regular day. He's not even at worship service. He's just at work tending the sheep of his father-in-law. He happens to go over here, what it says is, to the edge of the wilderness. And I wonder, what significance does that have in our text? In that, I think I'm on the edge of life sometimes. And I bet you are too, with some of the stresses that you and I go through. Does that what that means, that you're on the edge of the wilderness? And it's while he's there that he sees something in the distance that catches his attention. It happens to be a bush. Now, there are bushes in the wilderness and in the desert where he was. But this bush, there was something special about it. So what does Moses do? Does he look at this site and say, oh, how interesting now let's move on, little sheep. We're going to keep on going over here. And that's not what Moses does. Moses says in verse 3, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? And then this is the verse that I really caught on to. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called to Moses. You see what's happened in this text? Moses sees something that is beyond him. It's got his attention. He says, he's going to go, at least go see it. Check it out. He takes a step toward the bush. If Moses had not gone toward the bush, we may never have heard the story of Moses. That's when Moses was called. Moses, Moses, here I am, Lord. Just like so many of the prophets in the Old Testament. So the, 
the questions I think that you and I can start looking at in this text, beyond the deep theological questions of does God exist, is, is that you, God? You see, here, here you are looking at something maybe just outside your comfort zone, and you're so close that you can see it, are you willing then to take a step toward it and say, God, are you there? Or maybe the question is, are you standing somewhere on holy ground and you don't even know it? Take off your shoes, Moses, for you are standing on holy ground. Are you already standing on holy ground? Wherever you are, here, work, home, with someone else, that's part of the question that he's asking right here. The question, I guess, could be summed up with, have you had a real encounter with a spiritual, of a spiritual kind? Call it a burning bush if you're Moses. Uh, call it a Damascus Road experience if you're Paul. You can call it being born again if you're Nicodemus. But you know, I'm not interested as much anymore with those um, big theological questions of the, the name of God or the existence of God. What I'm really interested in is that this real God just doesn't exist, but that he is alive in me and in you. The scriptures say in 1 Peter that God is the living God. And this is the God who loves you and who loves me and wants that day-to-day -day relationship with us. That's the God that you are to be seeking, and that's the God that is seeking you. Now, I've heard people say, well, I've tried to find God, but you know, God just never come forth to make himself obvious to me. And if God would do something like that, it'd make all the difference in the world. It reminds me of the story of the man who once dared to speak to God. And he said, burn the bush like you did Moses, God, and I will follow Collapse the walls like you did for Joshua, God, and I will fight. Still the waves like you did on Galilee, God, and I will listen. And so the man sat by the bush, near a wall, close to the sea, and waited for God to speak. And God heard the man. So God answered. He sent fire, not for a bush, but for a church. He brought down a wall, not of brick, but of sin. He stilled a, so a storm, not of a sea, but of a soul. And God waited for the man to respond. And waited, and waited, and waited. But because the man was looking at bushes and not hearts, at bricks and not lives, at the sea instead of souls, he decided that God must not have answered him, and so he turned away. Now, God got Moses' attention through a burning bush. So my question to you is, how far do you want God to go to get your attention? What if he moved you to another land like he did Abraham? Or how about if he went through a voice of an angel like he did Gideon? Or what about put you in the belly of a whale like he did Jonah? Or about giving you a promotion like he did Daniel? Or a demotion like he did Samson? What would it take for God to get your attention? Isn't that the message all found through the Bible? The relentless pursuit of God the hunt of God, uh, what we used to call the hound of heaven. You see, my story is that I didn't want to be a minister for a long time. And I even lived in Europe for nine months. I came back here and I worked construction. I poured concrete. I traveled to California back. I did whatever it took not to go to seminary. But the hound of heaven 
The pursuit of God is always there. God's always seeking you and me. Make no mistake, God is on the search. Peeking under the bed for hiding kids. Stirring the bushes for lost sheep. Cupping hand to mouth and shouting into the canyon your name. Wrestling with all of us Jacobs when we're in the muddy Jabbok rivers of our lives. Isn't that what the Bible is telling us? The simple, clear message of the Bible? God made us. We rejected God. God continues to seek us and we have a choice. To accept or reject the love of God in Christ Jesus. So what does it take to get your attention? Sometimes, in order to get your attention, God will whisper, just like he did to Elijah, in a still, small voice. Is that you, God? Sometimes, to get your attention, God will be more like he was through John the Baptist, and and God will shout out, repent! for the kingdom of God is at hand. Is that you, God? And sometimes in order to get your attention, God is as creative as he is restless as we see right here in this passage of the burning bush. So what's your burning bush going to be? Is that you, God? You see, I think sometimes God puts us on holy ground. It's right over there. It got our attention. You can see it from here. There's something different about it right over there. But you're a little too far away from here. You're a little too careful in making a change in your life to go over there. A little too cautious maybe to take a step to go over there. Moses said, I will go over there. And see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look. Then God called Moses. As you look at this communion table over here. It is the best reminder that you and I have in order to get the attention of each and every person in this room that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, as a real human being to offer His life for ours so that we might have eternal life. You see, if there are a thousand steps between here and there, or even if there are just ten steps between here and there, God will take every single one of them except one. And that's the step that you have to take. Just like Moses The choice is yours. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we come before you to this table. And we give thanks for the opportunity to have a chance to claim our faith, to proclaim who you are in our lives, to take a step forward. Because we recognize you. We recognize something different. We recognize the sacrifice that your son made for us. And so nourish us with this spiritual banquet, we pray. Amen.